Next up will be Ryan, and he'll be talking about Orboot, a project I'm really excited about. Um, because you can see if you take some really good concepts of open source firmware and combine them with a really good fundamental part, the language, which is Rust in that case. So please give her a big round of applause for Ryan O'Leary. Thank you, Julian. Uh, so today I'm going to present Orboot. Um, so I've worked on it in the last few months with Ron, with Don, with Prachi, with Chris from Google. Um, and also want to thank Andreas Richter from the Rust Embedded Working Group. They have some excellent people there trying to make Rust um, easier to use in firmware, as well as Troy ben these um, from the Sci-5, who really helped us get Orboot to work on the High Five Unleashed Word. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to talk. I'm going to discuss what Warbu is, um, why we chose Rust for this project, um, some of the design principles behind the project, um, how we got it to run in QMU on the AST2500, the A-speed um, board, as well as um, on hardware on the High Five Unleashed board, um, as well as how you can get involved in the project. Um, so there's us working on. Um, or boot, trying to get to work on some hardware. Um, so yeah, first I'm going to go over what is Orboot. Um, so Orboot is essentially Quaboot without C. So I'll, I'll give you a moment to appreciate this plan. <laughs> uh, so it's a downstream, downstream fork of Quaboot, um, which makes it open source and GPL v2. Um, it's completely written in Rust. There's not a line of C code. Um, there's a bit of assembly, because you need a bit of assembly to initialize um, like the very low level uh, CPU and initializer stack pointer and stuff, but very little assembly. Um, and the main aim is to jump to the kernel as quickly as possible. Um, so this is sort of like the Linux boot model. We don't want the, the firmware to have any disk drivers or have um, like a network stack or a debug shell. We want to um, punt all that into Linux boot um, because Linux already has an excellent um, network stack, excellent drivers, very high performance, and we don't want to re-implement it all. Um, and the policy we really want to do going forward is to only accept fully open source components in this project. Um, so for example, we wouldn't want any closed source blobs like FSP, um, and we want all the data sheets for the project to be open source. Uh, sorry, not open source, but um, be able to view them publicly without an NDA. Um, so here's a basic boot flow of Orboot, and this is very similar to Quaboot. Um, so we start with the, what we call the boot blob. It's not a single block, it's a, it's a blob of code. Um, and this is mostly assembly. It, it executes directly out of SPI. Um, it's the first instruction in firmware. It does the simple tasks like initializing the CPU, um, printing a welcome message, so in case it crashes later, you knew something happened at least, uh, sets up the, the SRAM or caches RAM, um, and then it finds and it jumps to the realm stage. Um, so the realm stage mainly has one purpose. So at this point, you can't start Linux yet because your machine hasn't initialized the main memory. Um, you only have about um, 30 kilobytes or to like a few megabytes of SRAM or caches RAM. Um, so at this point, the code just initializes um, the RAM or the DDR controller. Um, so once that's done, we go to what we call the payloader stage. Uh, so this is a bit different from the RAM stage in Core Boot. The payloader stage has one purpose. It is to run the payload, and it doesn't do anything else. So there's no shell, no USB stack, no storage drivers, no nothing else. It just loads the payload and jumps to it. Um, so that's why we called it the payloader stage, to prevent other, uh, like other things from getting in. Um, then finally, you usually jump to a kernel such as Linux, which performs the, the job of Linux boot, um, which has a NetRamFS, which either fetches the next kernel from the network or loads from disk, et cetera. Um, and one other goal of Orboot is we want to focus on performant boot. Um, so the holy grail of firmware is to be able to boot machine in less than a second. Um, as you probably notice, machines nowadays get slower and slower. Um, so like a, your laptop or desktop may take a few minutes to boot. Um, servers could take 
like up to 10 minutes. BMCs could take a few minutes. Um, but it doesn't have to be this way. And there's many counterpoints, like Chromebooks boot quickly. Servers from like a decade or two ago booted quickly. Um, like where there's um, requirements such as in automobiles to boot quickly, machines can boot quickly. It's definitely possible. Um, but there are a few pain points, like memory training takes time. Um, oftentimes, drivers aren't run concurrently, which slows down the boot process, um, and a, a few other things. So a, a main goal is to be able to boot the Hi5 processor, um, which is Linux capable, into Linux in less than a second. Um, so now I'm going to talk about why we chose to use REST and why we didn't want to use C. Um, and this is kind of similar to the discussion, which happened, I guess, two decades ago, of why do you want to use C? Why can't we use assembly in our firmware? Um, and the main reason to use REST uh, is because it's a, it's a more modern language. It's a language which, which was created in the last decade. Um, and you have many features to show, uh, many features which benefit the productivity, uh, the quality of the code, the reliability, the security. Um, so for example, we have the borrow checker. Um, I don't know how many of you are you familiar with REST here? Oh, quite a few. It's really good. Uh, so we have namespaces. Um, you don't need linker sets like in C. <laughs> you have hygienic macros. Um, you have type safe printfs. Um, you don't have to care about inlining code as much. You have a standard package manager. You have REST format, and on and on and on. Um, so I'll go over each one of these briefly. Uh, so the core principle of the borrow checker, and this, reading this sentence in the REST programming language book really enlightened me. The core principle of the borrow checker is at any given time, you can have either one mutable reference or any number of immutable references. References must always be valid. Um, so REST doesn't really have pointers. Instead, you have an owner of data, and then you have references to it. And you can have multiple immutable references to that data, or you can have one mutable reference to it. Um, so here's an example of C code, which is really bad. There's multiple problems here. Um, so one is, well, you're casting from an int pointer to a void pointer, which is generally a bad idea. But the bigger problem is there's no guarantee that what x points to will outlive y. So your static y variable might outlive the thing it's being pointed to. Um, so this is legal C. It's very bad. Um, it's not possible to do something this bad in REST unless you use unsafe keyword. Um, REST will greatly increase safety. And uh, with the borrow checker, it provides um, more opportunities to the REST compiler to optimize your code. Um, I'll have a, an example of using the borrow checker in REST later. Um, another great feature of REST is namespaces. Um, so in a lot of projects like Linux or Core Boot, you see that you have an arc directory. And inside of your arc directory, you have like RISC-V, you have ARM, you have x86. And in each one of these folders, you have an implementation of, for example, the halt function. Um, so you have three functions with the same name. And when you compile that in C, generally, you would have a multiple functions with the same name error in your linker. Um, and the way they work around this in C is mostly hacks. So you have if defs, you have weak symbols, um, you have some magic in your make files. Um, sometimes you have pointers. Um, but in REST, you have a very simple mechanism called namespaces, where you simply put each hold function into its own respective namespace. Um, and then when you import it, you could rename the namespace to architecture, and you don't have to have any of these silly hacks. Um, another great thing about REST is it pretty much alleviates the need for linker sets, if you know what that is, um, which is it's a very good thing. It also makes the make files a lot less crazy. Um, so this is an example of part of the make file in Core Boot. Um, there's a lot going on here. Um, but you can see that it does get messy. Um, in REST, you have this tool called Cargo, which essentially like figures out the dependencies for you and has a much simpler language than this. Um, another great thing about REST over C is it has what they call hygienic macros. In C, macro expansion happens um, before, just after tokenization, but before the parsing stage in the compiler. 
Um, so you could have strange things like this, where uh, your macro accidentally captures an identifier from outside the macro, or, or something would hack it happens, or like in this example, um, there should be more parentheses around the identifiers. Um, uh, an example of this is the format args function in Rust, where you can uh, the the formatting happens at compile time using a hygienic macro. And this example here, the exclamation mark indicates that's a macro. The two curly brackets indicate where the formatted arguments go. So the first string goes into the first curly bracket. The seven goes into the second one. Um, you don't have to think about should I use a percent %d or should I use a percent %lu or should I use a percent %llu. Um, at compile time, it automatically figures out the types. If you put too many arguments, it's a compile time error. If you have an argument which you can't print, it's a compile time error. Um, in C, it's like that's like you can have mistakes like that. We cast the five to a car pointer, and this is completely undefined behavior. There's uh, the compiler usually doesn't check that. Some in some compilers you have warnings, but um, it's undefined behavior. Um, here's another example in C. Um, of undefined behavior. Uh, it's kind of difficult to tell, but that buffer, there's no guarantee that this buffer is initialized to a value. It actually depends on the implementation of VAS print. In some standard libraries, it might initialize it to a valid value, in some it might not. Um, so this is solved in Rust because you can't have a reference to something that is not valid. Um, move need for inlining. Oh, another great thing is Rust format. In many C projects, you might find different developers argue over tabs versus spaces or comment styles. Um, in Rust, there is one way, which is you run Rust format on your code, and you just don't talk about it anymore. And Rust format also has um, also simplifies the code here. So you can see, um, so this is a diff before and after running Rust format. And you can see it removes this empty um, generic uh, thing. Uh, this simplifies the code. It wasn't needed. It's quite nice. Um, so now I'm going to go over the design principles behind Orboot. Um, we have this thing called the driver model. Um, and we're still debating whether or not this is the correct model. Um, but we find it quite useful so far. So essentially what a trait is in Rust, a trait is kind of like an interface. Um, and you implement this interface by implementing the four functions. You have an init, you have a read, a write, and a shutdown. Um, so we call it pread, it's positional read. The second argument is the position, the same as pwrite. Um, when you read, um, you pass in a mutable buffer. So a reference to a mutable buffer. The read function fills in the buffer with data from the driver, and it returns a result type. So a result type in Rust is either um, a number, so in this case it would be u size, a number, or it's an error. And the error, as you see up here, is a string. So all our error codes are strings, which you can print and are human readable. Um, so we kind of, this driver is kind of, it could be used for like what you'd call block devices or car devices, um, since you could ignore, the driver could ignore the position, like the offset, um, and it behaves kind of like a car device, or it could be used as kind of a, a block device as well. Um, so here are some examples of the drivers we implemented. Uh, so we have um, what we call physical drivers, which are backed by actual devices and hardware. Uh, so we have memory, which reads and writes to memory. We have a couple serial drivers. Uh, they read and write to serial devices. Um, we have clock, DDR. Um, they initialize the clock and DDR respectively. Then what we have are these useful things called virtual drivers. So these ones aren't backed by actual hardware, um, but they still implement the driver interface. So we have union. Um, this one's very useful. And you, you sort of, it's useful in the sense that if you have multiple UART drivers in the mach um, machine, so for example, if you have UART 0, UART 1, um, you can create a union of them. And whenever you perform a write to the union driver, it pushes the characters to both of the UARTs. So it's kind of like a, a fork. I'll, I'll explain it more in the next slide. Um, then we have a slice reader. So if you're not familiar, a slice is kind of like an array in Rust. Um, and essentially, this driver just reads from a, a pre-filled in slice. 
Um, this is useful in testing, as well as a section reader. Um, this one's particularly useful. So for example, if you have a spy device, um, which reads from a, like just say for example, your spy is 32 megabytes, we kind of want to have a driver which um, is a partition of that spy device. You can initialize a slide re reader with the offset and size, so that driver can only read from that small partition of the spy driver. And we use it, the section reader for multiple things. It's pretty nice. Uh, so yeah, here's an example. Um, where we create a console with multiple UATs. Uh, so this was on the AST2500, and they had five UATs. Um, so we kind of wanted to write to all the UATs at once. We created an array of them. We created the union driver using this array. Uh, we initialized it. When we do an init, it knits all the drivers, all five of them. We do a P write. So we write to it. It doesn't matter what the position you write to it, because it's a, kind of like a card device. And you write to it, it writes welcome to Waboot to all the UATs. Um, and then um, down here, we showed the example of using the, uh, like the, the VAS printf, um, the, the macro, the format args, and we kind of write the format to output 7 to that console. Um, so we essentially get printf for free here. Um, it's easy to add and configure new drivers. Um, we, we don't have to re-implement printf like every other C project in existence. Um, so here's an example. So with that in mind, here's an example of the borrow checker and where it saved us. Um, so in this example, we initialize UART, we init UART, we write A to UART, and that's all fine. Um, then we tried to initialize the clocks. So if you see down there, the line with clock new. Um, that creates a new clock driver, and then we have p rate on to the clock driver, and that turns on the clocks. Um, but when you turn on the clocks, you have to update the divider in the UART. Otherwise, the UART will be much faster than expected. So first you decrease the divider in the UART, then you turn on the clocks um, so that the UART has that constant 115200, sorry, 115200 baud rate. Um, so we pass in all the drivers into the um, clock, and it flushes your drivers before changing the speed such that you don't lose any characters. Um, so in this case, we're essentially passing um, the clock driver is taking a mutable, a mutable reference to the UART driver we initialized here. And it's using this reference. So we initialize a new clock driver, and it's using this reference on this line inside the pwrite function. But since the clock driver has a reference, we can't also pwrite to it here. But we can pwrite afterwards because the clock driver is no longer borrowing the reference to the UART driver. And um, this might seem complicated. And you can see here's the, the error message here. Uh, the error message is actually quite useful. It says um, the line where the first mutable borrow occurs um, and the line where it was later captured, and as well as where the second mutable reference occurs. Um, and so it's good to remember this quote. At any given time, you can have either one mutable reference or any number of mutable references. References must always be valid. Um, so that breaks the first rule. Uh, so this is how we lay out flash in Orboot. Um, the, the flash on the, the Hi5 processor where we tested this uh, has 32 megabytes, which is much more than we need. So we're kind of, um, we kind of had large partitions, much larger than we needed. So the boot, boot blob, which is the, the initial assembly, jumps down to the ROM payload. Um, and this is the A and B partition. And then we have the RAM payload, A and B partition. Um, we invented this thing called a uh, device tree file system. So we store all the information in essentially a device tree. It's kind of a, an abuse of what you might think of device trees, like a list of devices. Essentially, it's a list of files stored in a device tree to be used as if it were a file system. Um, and the, the reason we found this convenient is originally we were planning to use CBFS. And to be able to access the files from Linux in CBFS, we were originally planning to write a kind of a fused file system to read CBFS from Linux. But we found if we just used DT, like device trees, uh, 
we can pass the device tree into Linux through the typical means, and the device tree would appear under sysfirmware-dt. So all the files that you'd have access to in firmware, you can pass to the kernel through this interface. Um, so for example, if you wanted to store a, like a, um, for example, a splash screen that you want to display in Linux, you store in the DTFS um, externally to Linux, and it will automatically appear in sys firmware DT. And it's kind of an abuse of semantics, because the device tree is supposed to be for devices, but you can also store files in it, which we found quite nice. Um, so currently, Orbu is only 31 kilobytes, um, which is very small. It's about 1,000 times smaller than the, the flash part. Um, so this is an example of how like the, the device tree file system, you can see the files that we store in it, um, and like how we, we mapped that previous description of the areas to a device tree format. Um, this is kind of how we our build system. So currently, we use what they call the, the cargo make extension to cargo. Um, so we still have these make files, but in, they're in a TOML format. Um, we're trying to avoid key config, but it seems like we'll have to come up with a, a similar system um, because it's a bit difficult to like configure stuff by directly editing the make files at this time. Um, here's an example of the, the source organization. Um, we, it's very similar to core boot. It's based off of core boot. We have the main boards inside each main board. We have a vendor, and then we have the or individual boards inside the vendor directory. Um, we have socks, which uh, the main board usually imports a sock, and the sock imports the drivers, so the main board imports the drivers directly. Um, payloads is outside of the source directory because you could build a payload externally to building Orboot and add the payload later. Um, another useful property of REST is there's no dynamic, you could use it without any dynamic allocation. It's very easy to uh, stack allocate everything. Um, and REST has a, has a tool you can use with the LLVM compiler to tell you how large your stack size is. Um, so at compile time, you can prove that you won't have a stack overflow because the compiler told you how big a stack is. You make sure you allocate that much space. Um, and then you don't really have to worry about there being a stack overflow. Um, something else we want to implement is coroutines. Um, so the squared again is useful here. At any given time, you can either have one mutable reference or any number of immutable references. References must always be valid, which is very similar to databases in Rust. Sorry, databases in uh, computer science. So you have a database when you have two things relating to the same object at the same time in memory. Um, in Rust, that's not possible because you can't have two mutable references to the same thing. Um, which sort of, in a way, makes REST memory safe, as long as you don't use the unsafe keyword. Uh, this is something we've not implemented yet, um, but it's something that we will need if you want to have our um, the holy grail of firmware, which is one second boots. Um, so we'd have a separate coroutine for UART, separate one for SPY. Um, they'd be polling on um, uh, being ready for new data, um, and um, at each cycle the poll, they would yield the schedule, the schedule, the round robin, everything that was yielding to it. Um, it's fairly simple, um, but we, we still need help to implement this. <laughs> so, OK, so uh, finally, running on hardware. So our first target was QMU system ARM. Um, this demo is very short. Um, we, only, we only did this one in QMU. Um, so you see here, when you run it, OK, CD to the right directory. Let's see if you can speed this up. CD mainboards, emulation, PMU. Um, we have this uh, convenience function in make file, which is cargo make run, and it just runs it for you in QMU. Um, so you can see here, um, what we did was it went by kind of fast. Um, but you can see it printed out the device tree, then boot Linux, it jumped to U root, and then inside the U root shell, um, I listed some directories. Um, so this was relatively simple, um, but this was only in QMU. When we went to, um, when we went to port it from QMU into hardware, 
we had some difficulty because the data sheet um, uh, was NDA. So we didn't have access to the data sheet, um, which made the protein kind of difficult. Um, so instead, we jumped to VISC5. Um, so this is a high five on an each board. Um, it has a Sci5 FU540 processor. It has one management processor, and it has four processors which are capable of running Linux. Uh, it has eight gigabytes of DDR4. It has 32 megabytes of flash. It has Spy, UART, pretty much everything you want. Um, it's very convenient to program. Uh, the architecture is a bit different from ARM. Uh, so you can see here, the boot blob runs from um, ran, so the code starts on the, the management core. Uh, you run, uh, you initialize the CPU, set up the car, um, then you jump to the realm stage where uh, you print the UART message, initialize the clocks in the PRCI, which is a power reset clock interrupts unit. Um, you initialize the DDR. Um, so until DDR is initialized, use the cache as RAM, the L2 cache. Um, it's fairly simple to initialize DDR. And then you copy the payload from SPY into RAM, and you jump to it, and the payload is Linux. Um, so the way we programmed this was with the Deddy prog. Uh, you have to make sure these end cell bits are in the right positions. Um, and in this position, it jumps over the FS FSBL and the BBL, and it goes right to our boot. So we skip the existing bootloaders on the system. Um, the boot blob is very small. So this is all the assembly we have in our boot. It's like one, two, three, four, five lines. Um, so we initialize caches RAM. Um, we spin, currently we spin all the CPUs except for CPU zero. Um, we want to implement SMP in the future, but currently we're only booting one CPU. And then we jump to the start. Uh, the ROM stage is some simple UART prints. Um, then we initialize the clocks. And you see, this is the first time we initialize the clocks. We made the mistake where UART is running at this baud rate, and the UART is a clock divider on the, the core clock. And once we initialize the clocks, it jumped to like 50 times faster than the expected baud rate. So that shows you first have to drop the clock divider, then initialize UART. Um, the memory in it was fairly simple. Essentially, it's code which copies. There's like a 1,000 control registers. You just copy them into the memory mapped address. Um, we use the FSBL and the core boot implementations as reference. Um, it's pretty much currently, it's pretty much a direct C to REST translation of the code. Um, it was only a few days of work, which is, is fairly easy. Um, eventual goal is to boot the kernel in M mode. Um, so currently, we're using this patch, um, the no MMU patch from Christoph Helwig. And this lets us boot the kernel in M mode on, in QMU. It currently does not support actual hardware. Um, that's hopefully something we want to work on on the hackathon this week. Um, it's a very exciting project. So if you don't know, M mode is kind of the, the SMM mode of VISC-5. Um, but we want to run the kernel in this M mode um, OK, so this is how you can get involved. Um, so we have a discussion at Slack here, the Orboot channel on the root Slack. Um, we have GitHub. There's a bunch of bugs you could look at. Um, if you're kind of new to REST and you want to learn about REST, I highly recommend this online book. The way I learned REST is you go through every single chapter. You look at the code in every chapter. You type it out by hand. Um, make sure it compiles. Try flipping around some lines in the code to see how the um, to see how the Bahu checker reacts. Um, it, it takes a bit of time to learn, but it's definitely worth it. Uh, if you want to learn VISC-5, I highly recommend this book. It's a short 100, I think 130 pages, but it describes the entire VISC-5 architecture, um, which is very short for whole architecture. Um, and then we have a, there's a bunch of tasks we kind of want help with. Um, and we'll probably be working on some of these uh, in the hackathon this week. Um, so if you want to drop by and like experience what it is like to work on Core Boot, oh sorry, Core Boot, uh, please feel free. And that's it. Any questions? Thank you, Ryan. Let's have another round of applause for Ryan. <laughs> and you're exactly on time. So we have time for about 10, 10 questions. Yeah, just go up to oh. the microphones and ask your questions. Just line up.
Yeah. Uh, you said something about no NDAs, but one of your supported target is the A speed, which does not have a non NDA manual. Yeah. Uh, and that's the reason we moved away from the A speed and worked on the Hi Fi processor. So, are you planning to remove it until um, Speed gives you an open manual? or It's pretty much removed at this time. So, you can still find the source code there um, in a directory, but it likely doesn't compile it because you moved it from a CI system and no one really tests it. So, if, if feel free to send a patch to remove it. <laughs> um, I'd be interested how uh, the code size looks with Rust. Because, for example, you said that you essentially get a printer for free, right? But you don't really get it for free. You get it by dragging in a giant standard library. So yeah. So currently, all the Orboot code that we use to boot, um, actually, in QMU, um, we use it. So we use the same Orboot binary for QMU and on hardware, um, which is kind of nice, because you could test in QMU. You could take the same one, test on hardware. Um, to boot Linux in QMU, uh, it's only 31 kilobytes, uh, and that's including the printf statement. So it's very small. Um, I'm pretty impressed by the LLVM compiler. We use what they call link time optimizations, which is really able to like remove a lot of code. Like it, it, it's kind of inlining, but between different modules in the code, it's very, very, very good. But have you done something like? take about the same amount of code, like the same driver or something from core boot and or boot and compare? Um, we haven't really done that comparison yet, no. How do you boot the same or boot on QMU and hardware? Uh, so essentially, what we have is, um, it's kind of a, a hack, but we have these is QMU functions. So is if it is not QMU, we skip. But how do you know the, QMU? Oh, uh, there's actually a, a few ways of telling. What we do right now is we look at this register in the mask ROM, and on QMU, we know it should be this value. And on hardware, we know it's that value. And they kind of differ in the implementations. Um, so in the future, QMU might look more like hardware, in which case we kind of have to change our is QMU function. Um, but for now, it, it works. All right, so what's the plan for like running on the High 5 Unleashed in QMU, the model of the Unleashed in QMU? Um, yeah, so right now, uh, the machine type we're using QMU is the sci 5 underscore U. Um, we, have, we had to make a few patches to that to make it look more like hardware. So for example, um, QMU loads the, the firmware at the offset 0x8 with seven zeros, when hardware it loads it at 0x2 with seven zeros. So we had to make some patches in QMU to add that section and load into a different place. Um, um, but for the most part, it's, the code is very similar. Oh, OK. So you're running the sci-fi view, though, not the yep. machine. Okay. That's right. I have another question. We'll come back. Okay. Why do you have to uh, use the initialize the UART and then adjust the clocks? Why you don't do it uh, when you before you initialize the UART or during the initialization? Oh, because we want, we want some prints to happen before we initialize the clocks, and we want some prints to happen afterwards. But since the UART, um, they use the same clock source. It they use the, they use the clock source, the same one as the CPU. So the CPU clock source by default it runs at 33 megahertz, and then when we initialize the PLL, it jumps to I think one gigahertz. Um, and since the UI is a clock divider on that clock, you kind of have to change the divider at some point. Okay. So you want to see some UARTs for debug yeah. before you bump the yeah. Board. That's right. Okay. And uh, I have another question. Uh, uh, do, uh, would Rust will be a good potential to replace other usage of C, or it's only kind of targeted to bootloader BIOS and oh, it's definitely is level. like um, elsewhere. So actually, um, from my understanding, Rust was originally created by Mozilla to be used in their web browser oh. um, because they have a lot of um, I think it's a web layout. I, I'm not too familiar with the field, but they they want to lay out their web pages, but concurrently. And it's very difficult to do safely in C++. Um, so they wanted to put that to a safer language, but one didn't exist, which was efficient. So they created REST for the task. Um, but it was also found that REST was also very useful for uh, bootloaders or like firmware in general. So it's kind of the, the other way around. First, it was used in other fields, and then it moved to firmware. OK, thank you. Another question. Yeah. Um, why M mode Linux? Oh, why? Um, 
I, I think the <laughs> so I guess, I guess the idea behind this is um, uh, like we're from a mostly x86 background our team, and we have this aversion to to SMM mode yeah. and seeing M mode on Risk Five, we, we sort of have the same aversion, um, and we feel that we can sort of solve this problem by running the kernel in M mode in the most privileged mode, um, and then there won't be anything below the kernel which interferes with it. So that's nice, but then there's no MMU, right? So yeah, and no hypervisor support, and I mean, it's... yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. But it also, but there's more than that, right? Hypervisors don't work. Then, if you're running in M mode, you know, other future yeah. things, you're going to uh, run into lots of issues. <laughs> <laughs> okay. just, wanted, just, just wanted to add one yeah. point. So. Uh, no MMU mode, the no MMU port, the patches and uh, you pointed out. Yep. So it does work on the can write board hardware. Yeah, yeah, can that's right. So you said no hardware supported. So oh, yeah, that's true. So yeah, you can try the can write. Yeah, corrections. Yeah, so it works on the, K, it's the K210, yeah. um, but it doesn't work on high five at the moment. But I think our, our main goal is to get it to work on the high five this week. Uh, Rust is a relatively young language. And this is the, the first project I've heard of that uses it for firmware. Were there any challenges in making it work in embedded development? Um, actually, it's fairly easy. Um, I think most of the work has already been done to get it to work in for firmware. Um, albeit, we actually do use the nightly version of Rust. You can't do any of this in the stable version. Um, but the working group for uh, firmware um, for Rust has done a really good job like setting up all the tools and making them easily accessible. Um, there are a few tutorials you could find online um, to, to set up your uh, tool chain to build Rust for firmware. So I had another question. You mentioned there's no blobs, but yeah. then you said to initialize memory, you just copy like two kilobytes or whatever, 10 kilobytes of uh, something into registers. Yeah, that's a blob, actually, isn't it? Yeah. So I guess it's um, I guess yeah. There's some semantics behind it, but uh, so like it's not the blob isn't executable code. It's like a bunch of register configurations specific to this board. Um, it is true that we don't necessarily know what all these control registers do, um, but at least it's not like ex executable code that we don't know what it does. Um, but still, you do you do have a, a good point. Um, as far as I know, at the moment, there aren't as as far as DDR controllers go. Um, it's very hard to find one which is actually fully open uh, open source. I, I just wanted to mention, after I put the tooling, um, I laid out the first RISC V sort of structure, and then I did a cargo make and watched the thing say, "Oh, looks like you need the RISC V version of Rust." Okay, pulling it down, done. A few seconds yeah. later. For anyone who's ever been through the hell of cross GCC building, it was quite oh, yeah. a miracle to watch it happen. Yeah, the yeah the tooling is fairly excellent. So, like for example, um, with cargo, um, you just type cargo object dump, and it does an object dump, and you don't have to care if it's this five or arm or whatever. You just you just type cargo object dump, and it figures out the architecture for you and dumps the um, the the assembly code. It's quite nice. So, like if you compare that to GCC. We you have your RISC 5 GCC toolchain and your ARM GCC toolchain. You have to make sure you have the right one, and you have to pass in the right arguments and everything. It's a, it's, it's very nice. So, um, it, last question. <laughs> it, it sounds like you're not doing memory training. Are you planning to do memory training? Because all those magic numbers you're copying probably have to change based on variations in the board to yeah. reach maximum memory performance. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's that's probably true. So we're using the um, the the values of the control registers specific to um, the high five board at this time, but um, performing actually actual memory training should be fairly similar, I, I believe. I, I'm not too experienced though. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Please give another round of applause. <laughs>